Hello everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Jack Edwards and last summer I went interrailing which was one of the best things I have ever done. Today I wanted to sit down and make a video about all of the things I learned, all of the top tips and tricks that I picked up along the way um, to help make your trip more into rail than into fail. So I suppose the first question is, should you go into railing? And the short answer is absolutely yes. If you are the type of person who loves an adventure, you don't mind pushing yourself and you want to see more of the world, but you don't have much time to do it and you don't want to do it on a huge budget, interrailing is for you. You really get a feel for each country, even if you don't stop off in the country, just going through it on the train, you get to see so much more. You see all the rural villages and the farmhouses and, and the countryside and, you know, all of those things that you just would not get to see if you flew to a capital city, explored the capital and then flew back home again. You learn so much about yourself from traveling, being quite self-sufficient, um, looking after yourself. You just learn more ways of the world, you have to communicate with different people, you have to problem solve because problems do arise, that will happen. You know, you have to book yourself into hostels, um, meet new people in the hostels, that kind of thing. It's just the best character building you could ever do. And also, it's so much fun while you do it. So, now that I've sold the experience to you, it's time to talk about packing. Emotional baggage not included. You will need a big rucksack, a DOV style rucksack. You can usually get them in camping shops, that kind of thing. Something that is pretty hefty and strong. I had a bag that opened at the top, but I think actually if I were to do it again, I'd get a bag that opened kind of like a suitcase so that you could pull it the zip all the way round, um, if that makes sense, just because then you can lift it up and get specific things out of the bag without having to remove absolutely everything. But the one thing that was an absolute game changer for me was packing cubes. Now packing cubes are basically um, like fabric uh, cubic shapes um, that you can unzip and put your clothes into. They usually have a mesh front so you can see what's inside. It just means that every time you open your bag you can see everything that you've got. You don't have to um, rummage around and, and lose things. It just compartmentalizes the inside of your bag and makes it so much easier because those bags are huge and it's so easy to lose things. In terms of things that you actually need to pack, remember all your travel documents. Um, I kept mine in like a Ziploc bag so I just had all of our train tickets, all of our hostel reservations, our timetable for the whole trip, all in a Ziploc bag that was just in the front of my rucksack so that I always had it. Also you probably need about like seven to nine kind of t-shirts or, or tops, one, two pairs of shorts and some swimming stuff. Um, you know, don't go overboard, um, underwear, socks, uh, all the essentials. The way that we did it was we bought enough stuff to wear for the first half of the trip and then when we got to Budapest, which was our middle stop, we uh, went to a laundrette and um, managed to <laughs> kind of wash our clothes. Like we had to get this, this random lady in the laundrette kind of took pity on us and helped us do it because all of the instructions were not in English. <laughs> but we did get there in the end um, and it was quite inexpensive. I think we maybe paid about 50 pence per person. We put all of our stuff in together. We did like a lights and a dark wash. Um, and yeah, that just made things quite easy. Remember all of your charges for phones, cameras, etc. Um, a comfy hoodie. You will need a comfy hoodie, especially for those long train journeys. It does get cold in the evenings. Um, something to sleep in if you're staying in hostels. Comfortable shoes are a must. Um, Flip-flops or sliders to wear in communal showers. And so important, entertainment for the journeys. Brings a pack of cards. A pack of cards will go a long way. Load some books onto a Kindle. It's way lighter than carrying around loads of chunky novels. Um, and download loads of apps onto your phone. Uh, catch up in particular, make loads of really addictive, easy to play little games that you can just keep refreshing and it will never get old ever. And finally, you need a mini rucksack, like a day bag kind of thing, because you don't want to be carrying that huge rucksack on your back all the time because it will kill you. You will look a little bit like a human buckaroo, but you, you just have to be prepared for that. It's gonna happen, sorry. Now moving on from that, one of the top things that I learned from traveling is that almost every international train station around Europe has lockers that you can leave your huge rucksacks in whenever you need. So if you have to check out of your accommodation early in the morning, you can leave your bag in uh, the lockers. Um, it's locked for like, I think you can have it for 24 hours max, um, which is usually completely fine. And go off into the city without that huge rucksack and that's such a relief. We went to Vienna, for example, for 24 hours and the train station was on the other side of the city to our hostel. So we, when we arrived in uh, Vienna, we packed a little day bag, um, like an overnight bag. 
um, left our huge rucksacks in the lockers. Then we walked around the city for the whole day, ending up in the evening at the hostel. And that way we didn't have to carry those huge rucksacks on our back all day. Also, I completely forgot to tell you what route we did. So um, we went from, we started in London, obviously St Pancras, we went down to Paris on the Eurostar. We then went across to Munich, Ljubljana, got the bus to Lake Bled, then from Bled, uh, got an overnight train to Budapest. We then went to Vienna, then Seski Kromlov, which is a little city in the Czech Republic, which could probably have been missed if we were to miss anywhere off. Um, from there, we went up to Prague. From Prague, we went to Berlin and then Amsterdam and then back to London. So we got the Eurostar both ways um, to and from London. One really useful website for planning your trip is interrailplanner.com. Um, this is what I used personally to like map out my route. Um, you can set the number of nights in each place. You can just see it all on a map. Uh, if I show you, so this was the exact plan that we had for our route. It just means you can kind of see it. Um, tells you how long the journey times will be, all of that stuff, so this was great. I think on every Interrail trip you have to go to Amsterdam, it's such a cool place. Prague is lovely and cheap. Budapest again, really, really cheap and great. Uh, Munich, I loved the beer halls, that was so much fun. Ljubljana, a hidden gem in Slovenia and such a nice place. Those were some really nice places that we visited. I know I briefly mentioned it there, but overnight trains are a godsend. Um, with your Interrail pass, obviously you can only travel on a certain number of days, but overnight trains like the one to Budapest, if you leave after a certain time, I think if you leave after 7pm, uh, it doesn't matter what time you get off the train, it will only count as one of your journeys, which is so good. Um, so overnight trains can save you money on accommodation and also, you know, we, you just sleep on the train. When it's night time and you're exhausted from travelling all day, you just sleep. And so those really long journeys go so much quicker. So once you're in a city, how do you find things to see and do? Um, I used websites uh, hugely before I went, so I looked at like Lonely Planet, Go Euro, uh, lots of other like travel blogs and that kind of thing. Also, Instagram is such a huge one. Like you can look up cities and see where the top kind of photo locations are. And usually those areas that are good to get pictures from also have really nice little cafes or um, other things that you can kind of see and you get a real taste for the city. Also, it's really useful to look up the free attractions. So quite a lot of things in Europe are actually free, which is quite surprising. A majority of the museums and galleries are completely free to enter and also if you just get a currency converter on your phone and um, because remember that not all of the countries that you go to will have the same currency like uh, the Czech Republic Hungary doesn't have the same currency so um, if you get a currency converter you can actually work out we went to this place in um, Seski Kromlov and uh, it was like thousands and thousands to go up this tower and it turned out when we converted the currency there was actually like pennies for us we did occasionally pay a little bit extra to do exciting things so we did uh, pay about £75, I want to say, in Lake Bled to do a uh, rafting and canyoning day. Um, we'd kind of planned this in advance. We knew that we wanted to do some kind of excursion when we were in uh, Bled in Slovenia. Um, and it was really, really worth it. I'll never forget that experience. But back on the subject of free things, which I know you much prefer to hear about, um, there are free walking tours in pretty much any city. Hostels usually have all the information on those. They just meet at a central location and then a local tour guide will take you around um, give you loads of insider and knowledge. They're also really good for pointing out cheap restaurants um, and other free things to do. Um, but yeah, they'll give you a, a whistle-stop tour of a city and they just work on tips at the end So you just you can just tip them at the end um, if you want to I you, mean, you probably should but Even through just paying them via tips you're paying way less than you would do for a paid organized tour So next I wanted to talk about my experience with hostels and I'd never stayed in a hostel before this trip um, I was really anxious about it because I didn't know what to expect, but honestly, absolutely fine. Everyone there is so sociable, has a similar mindset to you because they're also probably traveling. Um, they're usually really clean. I think we, the most we stayed in was 32 people in one room and it was completely fine because everyone keeps themselves to themselves. You usually are in little kind of groups anyway and you can stick together. Usually you get given a name badge which you put on your bed, so that's your bed, you've reserved that bed. Um, and honestly, it's completely fine, don't worry about it. Some things I would note, firstly, is that Airbnbs or um, hotels can actually sometimes be cheaper than hostels. So don't think, oh, I have to stay in hostels because we stayed in some Airbnbs that were 
so much nicer than hostels and we, you know, they were completely private and they were way cheaper. Like Paris, for example, way, way, way cheaper to stay in, a host in an Airbnb, I mean. Also, if you do book using Hostel World, then just beware that they have a weird payment system where you pay like a little bit when you make the booking and you have to pay the rest up front. So just always know how much you owe and convert it into euros. Um, make sure that you've got cash because they don't usually don't take card. And also sometimes they will try and charge you a little bit extra. Um, so just be like, oh no, hang on, just have your receipt to hand and they'll change it straight away because they can't argue with Hostel World. Hostels and Airbnbs can also be the best places to find out about things to do in the city. So uh, they usually have discounts for certain things like boat trips maybe that or, or you know like a city pass they usually have discounts. They'll also usually have maps um, which you can take. I definitely recommend taking a map because um, Google Maps isn't always as reliable and it's not always as easy to find like big attractions that are near you. One thing also that is really good to bring is a padlock. Uh, usually hostels have lockers within the rooms that you can padlock shut. They usually charge you like two euros to rent a padlock, um, but if you just bring one yourself, then you don't have to pay that, and that's just an extra little thing that you can save. In terms of booking this accommodation, um, always make sure you've read all the reviews on Hostel World, TripAdvisor, all of that kind of thing, and remember to consider who is writing that review. For example, we stayed at the most incredible hostel in Amsterdam, but all of the reviews were quite negative because um, it was lots of older or middle-aged kind of people who had stayed there and complained that it was above a bar and that the bar didn't shut until 2 a.m. and uh, it was really noisy. We knew that we weren't going to be back before 2 a.m. so that was not a problem for us and I didn't notice any noise at all. Also always check where the location actually is. Quite often it'll say we're in Munich and Munich is a big place um, and they can be on the very outskirts of Munich and still claim they are a hostel in Munich so um, sometimes the really really cheap ones are miles out. Likewise check how much public transport costs because if there's a bus that is one euro to get into the city centre then it's worth paying a bit less. Next I wanted to talk about my favourite subject ever, food. One thing that is so important to remember is that prices in capital cities really really vary. So you can be walking down a street and there'll be three restaurants that are super super expensive and you'll be like oh we're just gonna have to settle for this. Around the corner will be a really really cheap place to get really good food. In Amsterdam, we you know, we were on these big streets where the food was so extortionate, exorbitant prices. Walk around the corner and everywhere was selling pizza, pasta, every like, like lasagna, everything for five pounds. So easy. Don't stop at the first place that you see just because you're hungry. Also, um, supermarkets can be really good for just grabbing some food there. Um, maybe a couple of nights try and cook some food up in your hostels. Uh, if they have a kitchen, check in advance if they've got a kitchen. In terms of money, we spent under a thousand pounds on our trip because we were really cost effective um, and I think that is probably a good amount to kind of aim for. I took some euros out with me, um, but I took what's called a loot card. So loot is a kind of company, they make these cards that uh, go on top of your online banking. Because they're technology on top of a bank rather than a debit or credit card, you don't get charged those extra hidden fees when you spend it abroad and it converts your money into local currency. So again, you don't get that added cost. The other perk is that you can pause the card at any time without canceling it. So um, on the app, you literally just press a pause button. That card then cannot be used at all. Um, but if you find it, you can just press play again and then it can be used again because if you cancel a card when you're abroad, it's quite unlikely that you're going to be able to get another one and then you're kind of screwed. The other thing that was really useful in organizing this trip was making a spreadsheet. So I have this uh, huge document here which just has, um, I'll talk you through it step by step. So here we have the date, um, so all of the dates that we were away for, um, and then have where we woke up, where we went to sleep, um, because quite often you wake up and then go to sleep in different cities, which is really, really cool, but also very, very confusing. Um, so I just color coded that so it was really easy to see. Um, I had all the depart train time, so like when we would depart from one place and arrive somewhere else. Um, the accommodation address um, and name so that we could find them. Uh, and then the type of uh, accommodation, so a hostel or an Airbnb. Um, then here I had the total cost that we paid for that accommodation and then that divided by the number of people who were staying the night. And then we've got the total costs down here, so we paid uh, £287.62 per person for the accommodation over the whole thing. Um, 
this was really useful. I printed this document out and laminated it so each of us had a copy um, and then also I gave one to my parents just so they could see where I was and when and where I was meant to be staying. Uh, but yeah, that worked really, really well and I would thoroughly recommend making one of these just to keep track of everything. And I think that is everything. I hope this video was useful. I hope that this has helped if you're planning an interrail trip or if you're not planning one, I hope that it's convinced you to book one because it's so much fun. Best experience I ever had. I vlogged the whole thing. So if you'd like to see a breakdown of each city, what we got up to, what we did, um, I documented the whole thing in a series called Off the Rails, which I will link at the end of this video and in the crotch box down below. So you can go and check those out if you'd like. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Give it a like if you liked it, if you like, and subscribe for more because we are getting dangerously close to 30,000 subscribers. What? I've been Jack Edwards. Hopefully I will still be Jack Edwards next time you watch. Uh, have a lovely day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>